going on? We are live from Menlo Park, California. My name is Jason Silva. You might know me from National Geographic's Brain Games, and I'm excited to welcome our live audience and those tuning in from around the world for a special event focused on the future of philanthropy and social impact with the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation. Now, if you guys know me, you know that I'm passionate about the future, I'm passionate about technology, I am passionate about impact and disruption, and I love examining where we are going and how we can intentionally shape our future. Now, we live in an incredibly dynamic and interconnected world, and now perhaps more than ever, we have the opportunity to advance solutions to some of our greatest challenges. But how do we do it? Well, today I'm thrilled to host a conversation among change makers, where we will highlight what we've learned about solving some of our greatest challenges and guidelines to maximize our positive human impact. We will also unveil new research to guide the current and next generation of impact leaders. Now more than ever, today's discussion is critical. So let's get to it. Please welcome to the stage, Michael and Susan Dell. Great to see you. Well, it's a uh, thrill to be here with you guys. How are you guys doing today? Great. How are you? Uh, I'm, I'm honored and We're excited. Doing great. Thank you. Excellent. So, um, Susan, can you tell us a little bit about your work with the foundation? Well, we started our foundation in our hometown of Austin, Texas, about 18 years ago. Wow. And our love for our own children drove our desire to focus the mission of the foundation on supporting children and families. And, sure. you know, as parents, uh, we all want the very best for our kids, right? I mean, that's how parents everywhere feel. Definitely. But there are families that struggle, especially those living in urban poverty. And mm -hmm. that's one of the messiest, most entrenched types of poverty. And we believe that helping those kids to be safe, be healthy and educated is one of the best ways that we can help make a difference in the world. That's, I couldn't agree more. Um, Michael, as you dug into your philanthropic mission, how did your business experience influence your approach? Well, somewhat like my business experience, you know, we kind of started with uh, no playbook, right? And, uh -huh. and we said, let's uh, use our instincts and let's experiment, let's take some risks, let's learn, let's take the learnings and sure. let's, you know, plow that back in and, and uh, see where it takes us. Mm. And, and what have you what have you learned from this endeavor? Well, we've learned that just like there's been you know pretty uh, enormous advancements in business and technology, the area of social impact is sure. also advancing. And uh, look, there's never been a more exciting time to be doing this work. I think a lot of the lessons, and you know, you talked about disruption yeah. and some of the amazing things going on in the world today. All of those things are converging together to allow for impact on a global scale mm. like never before. Mm. Uh, I love that. And I know you guys have a lot to share today from some of those lessons learned to new research on the new era of philanthropy. And I'm really excited. But before we get to that, you may all have seen this morning in Fast Company that Michael and Susan are investing an additional billion dollars in their work at the foundation, which is unbelievable. I mean, guys, wow. So, Susan, why now? Well, you know, we've seen over the past 18 years yeah. the positive changes and the major impact that mm -hmm. our foundation work has made in the lives of children and their families. And mm -hmm. we've learned so much, and we're just so excited to share what we've learned with others. And Wonderful. the reality is, you know, we're, we're just getting started. Just getting started. <laughs> Absolutely. Michael? We, we want to accelerate the impact that the foundation is having. You know, when Susan and I set this up, uh, almost two decades ago now, we said to ourselves, hey, we'd like to find a way to make a bigger impact on the world through our philanthropic work than uh, you know, we have through our company. Mm -hmm. That's a, still a pretty big challenge ahead of us. Because sure. uh, we, we got quite a company, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah. that's a topic for another, another conversation. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, so it's time to, to accelerate the impact. The, the foundation is also proven itself sure. and learned a lot, and mm -hmm. it's time to scale it up. Beautiful, I mean, an additional billion dollars, it's, it's fantastic, and Susan, what do you think this money really means to your mission? 
We anticipate that the increased endowment will allow us to provide additional resources to programs that we have around the world, mm -hmm. as well as increase our investments in social entrepreneurship in India, mm -hmm. uh, college success for low-income students in the United States and South Africa, as well as uh, uh, data-driven education across the regions. Beautiful. Michael? I think, I think it means that, that uh, again, we can extend the impact. And you know, one of the other things that, that you know, we want to do, look, we're all part of a community. We want to right. inspire others, yeah. not only to give their resources, but give their time, their talents, their skills, their expertise, uh, and get more involved in this kind of work. Yes. Beautiful. And that is actually the focus of the remainder of our conversation, the people and the ideas fueling the work that you guys are doing. So let's take a closer look at the past and into the future of the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation. It's about creating and accelerating human opportunity. And that is work worth fighting for, no matter how hard it gets. There's a tremendous amount of need in the world, and we saw an opportunity to help. Our mission is to improve outcomes for children living in urban poverty. This is one of the messiest, most entrenched types of poverty. Climbing out often requires breaking down existing systems and changing long-standing attitudes. Philanthropy often makes the mistake of thinking that we know exactly what people need. It's not about writing a check and sitting back. It's about actually being part of a larger solution. To have success at the community level, you need the community. And you really need to hear their voices in a very substantive, open-hearted way. That's how we started as a foundation, really focused on the work here in, in our hometown in Central Texas. And from there, we're able to, to look to expand that work into other geographies. From the very early days of the foundation, we haven't been afraid to set really big goals for ourselves. Together with our partners, we are constantly learning. Measurement is as important as good ideas, and so is sharing our successes and failures. Inevitably, we stumble and fall many, many times. We make many mistakes. And I, I think that's to be expected. Like Philanthropic capital is about investing in innovation taking risk, right? And taking risk and innovation generally mean that there's gonna be some failure along the way. But if you try something, if you take a risk and it misses, that's not a failure. You adjust and then you go forward. The future of our work is more about coming together across areas that we may have seen as separate before. Our philanthropic journey has taught us that tackling these big, hard social problems requires a mindset of patience, deliberation, and deep humility. This is the way we work, the way we approach problems, the way we create success. If we can join together to share not only our successes, but also our failures, it enables all of us to make a bigger impact faster. Wow, guys, amazing, beautiful. So Susan, as you look back at lessons learned and then you look ahead, how does it make you feel? Oh gosh, it makes me feel so optimistic because you know our team and uh, our partners, they all are really willing to dig in and mm. do the hard work that's required in order to drive positive change. And you know, we've learned that more and more people are uh, really um, have the sense of urgency around philanthropic work now. And that's just so inspiring to see. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And Michael, since you got started, how has the work changed? I think one of the big changes that's been happening in, the, in this world is that uh, people are realizing that there's more that they can contribute beyond just financial resources. Mm -hmm. It's their skills, their expertise, their time. In, in, our, in our company, you know, we'll have roughly a million hours, a million volunteer hours this year. Wow. And that's a, you know, tremendous, uh, uh, you know, a tremendous impact on the world. Absolutely. Uh, more and more people, more and more organizations are figuring out that volunteerism and other ways they can contribute mm -hmm can make a big difference. Incredible, and, and with technology, of course, we see borders and barriers breaking down all the time. Disruption is the name of the game. So Michael, I assume you are also seeing that in philanthropy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're, we're seeing it in the technology world where innovations, for example, in deep learning and machine learning right. are advancing the you know, healthcare outcomes with genomic right. research. 
we're seeing it where the best ideas, wherever they come from, rise to the top and you know, all the barriers are breaking down, whether it's in sectors, geographies, governments, et cetera. Mm. And, and Susan, what do you think is the role of philanthropists in that equation? Well, part of our role is taking risks where others won't. And mm -hmm. with that comes the risk of failure, right? But Always. you know, we don't see it as failure unless we're failing to share what we've learned and adapt and move forward. You know, we think people should take risk. <laughs> not, be, not be afraid to take risks. I, I agree with you. And, and you and your team, you guys work on incredibly complex issues. How do you know what works? It starts with listening. And uh -huh. you know, we talk to our partners, and you know, then we, we take that information and we translate that into goals and measurements. And then that allows us to prove what works and what doesn't work. You know? And then over the you know, past few years, our experiences, we've been able to craft what we call our you know, rules for engagement mm -hmm. and our principles for impact. I, I love that idea. The idea of principles to live by, reminders or core tenets or a mantra to guide the work. So up next, let's learn about the Dell Social Impact Principles. Take a look. When we think about the Dell Principles, each of those principles represents a mountain that we've climbed. And the great thing is we have those lessons and they influence and guide our work going forward, but it also enables us to then look at the next big opportunity and say, we can do that. We can do that and we follow these principles and we know we can make a difference there. If it looks easy, look closer. The only way to solve the surface level challenge is to address what's happening underneath. Use your passion and skills to dig deep and find the roots of the problem. Take the risks that your challenge deserves. Our greatest challenges require doing some things differently. Push the boundaries and be willing to take the risks where others won't. Stay the course. Behaviors change slowly. Time is often the most important investment you can make. It's going to take more than one try to make an impact, and it's going to take more than one success to make a difference. Money alone doesn't solve problems. Money doesn't solve problems, people do. A combination of talent, ideas, resources, and execution is the only way to create solutions that last. Invest in people. Collaboration among unlikely partners amplifies impact. Find people who challenge your thinking and invest in them. Measure mindfully. Evidence is the only way to know whether you're making a difference. But not all the data is created equal. Always measure, but be smart about what you measure and how. If it doesn't work, tell everyone. Your outcomes, both good and bad, are opportunities for others to learn and to do better. We all win when we learn together. This is worth it. No one ever said that creating lasting change was easy. The work ahead is incredibly challenging. When you see the real world impact your work has made, you'll know the effort was worth it. Welcome back, welcome back everyone. We're live from Menlo Park, California. We're glad to have you with us as we are discussing the future of philanthropy. Now, please welcome Janet Mountain, Executive Director of the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation. Yes. Hi, Janet. How are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm thrilled to have you here. Good so you. Um, tell us, Janet, what role do these principles that we just watched in the video play at the foundation? Well, today, almost two decades later. Wow. The foundation's work spans a number of geographies and program areas. Mm -hmm. But these core principles guide our work. They're at the heart of what we do and how we do it. That's awesome. And, and looking at these, some of these principles, they seem like interesting guides, right? Like, not only for social impact, but for life in general. One in particular that stuck out for me and I'd like to hear more about is, if it doesn't work, tell everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the work we do, it's not a competition. And we don't work in a vacuum. We okay. work alongside so many wonderful, committed people. Mm. And we're all setting big goals and doing big things and taking big risks. And not everything is going to work. Mm. But because we all share similar goals, we have a tremendous opportunity to learn as much from our setbacks mm. as we do from our successes. And so sharing those failures yeah. allows everyone to learn from them so we can all make a bigger impact in a shorter amount of time. And I totally agree with you. And I, and I, and I often wonder, like, why don't people talk about failure more? 
Well, honestly, in the world of social impact and philanthropy, funding typically follows positive outcomes. Mm. So therefore, it's not as common to talk about misses, but we really have to challenge ourselves mm -hmm. here, right? Talking about what doesn't work allows us to adjust and go forward stronger. Mm. Setbacks actually open up opportunities to think differently about new ways to approach old problems. And it's actually that cycle that allows us to stay the course, to stick with our projects, stand by our partners, even when the road gets challenging, which it will. Awesome, I love this idea of staying the course. Susan, can you tell us why is that a principle? I mean, are you saying stick with it as long as it takes to make a positive impact? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we've learned you have to be patient because behaviors change slowly. So we know how important it is to allow time to find and address the root cause of problems. And mm. It's not always obvious in the beginning. You know, mm -hmm. uh, when you first get involved, sometimes you don't even realize you're only seeing things at the surface level. So, you know, it takes time to understand the layers that create a problem. And for great solutions, that comes from deep understanding. And deep understanding takes time. Right. And, and Janet, how do you want the folks watching today to, to use these principles? The Do Dell Social Impact Principles, they're not a prescription. Okay. There are a set of lessons, a starting point, if you will, and we're sharing them because ultimately, we believe that social impact is a team sport. Yeah. And so therefore, if any of our lessons can help other people get to success faster, mm -hmm. or better define the role they wanna play in driving social impact, the better it is for all of us. Mm. And, and why is this important now, Janet? I mean, the foundation is many years into its work. We've talked a lot about what you've learned. Let's talk about where you, Michael, and Susan and the team are going. Tell us about the philanthropist's guide to the future. Well, we're always building on our own experiences. And in doing so, we started to sense some shifts in the way philanthropy is practiced and understood. And we, for our own team's sake, wanted to understand these shifts at a broader level, beyond just what we were seeing. Mm -hmm. So we commissioned a group of researchers to survey hundreds of professionals working in the social mm -hmm. impact space. Mm -hmm. And the result of that is a philanthropist's guide to the future. Because after we saw the results, we wanted to share those insights with anyone interested mm -hmm. in learning more about this new era of social impact. That's awesome. I mean, it, it does sound like a guidebook for the future of doing good, which I love. Can you tell us more like what you found out? Yeah, actually, a number of interesting points. First was that more than half the people working in social impact prioritize access to high-level decision makers mm. and networks, mm. strategic counsel, and actually direct volunteer field work over direct funding. Wow. So this validated our thinking that while money is always important, time and talent mm. are equally important and really critical to impact. I love the value of time and talent. It makes me think of the shared economy. What else? Well, secondly, we also asked people where they believed the best social impact ideas would come from over yeah. the next decade. Sure. 62% of people believe that social entrepreneurs will be driving the most innovative ideas mm -hmm. for effective solutions. Mm -hmm. And another 40% believe that those ideas, the best ideas, will be coming from people who are directly affected by the work. Wow. And this is significant, right, because it represents a shift mm -hmm. from looking to large institutions for answers and solutions to actually turning the, to those closest to the issues for their creativity and expertise. Mm. And Susan, uh, what else did you find interesting? Well, over 70% of our respondents reported that they believe philanthropists should stay in the game huh. even when certain programs fail. So essentially, they're telling us we should stay the course and keep at it yeah. you know, until we reach success. And you know, that's just a few of the key findings. Yeah. Wonderful. I mean, I'd love to keep talking about this forever and more time to dig into this specific research, but I want to get to the people who are featured in the Philanthropist Guide to the Future. So for you guys at home, go to impact.msdf.org to download the full report. So, okay, coming up, guys, we're very excited. We're going to meet a few of the people at the center of the Philanthropist Guide to the Future. Susan, can you tell us more? Well, what I'd like to tell you is that we actually think the word philanthropist needs a facelift, a okay. little bit of a makeover here. Uh -huh. And uh, it's because you know the, the original definition of philanthropist, uh, the Greek definition of philanthropist is uh, so simple. Uh -huh. It's uh, the love of humanity. Beautiful. And you know, 
We really like that definition because it says that a philanthropist is anybody yeah. who cares for others. And so we prefer that. Wonderful. Today's philanthropist can be a social entrepreneur with an idea for a new business that yeah. can better serve the poor. Sure. Or it could be a group of professionals working to make their own community mm -hmm. a better place. Mm -hmm. Today's philanthropist is really anyone who works for a positive change mm. close to home or on a global scale. And we've started calling them conscious disruptors because yeah. they're really driven by this social impact mindset. Exactly. I love that term. Conscious disruptors, folks. I do love the sound of that. <laughs> so let's take a look now at three conscious disruptors. Roll the video, please. The public narrative on philanthropy is that it's this you know, lovely, rewarding experience, but I think if you really sink your teeth into a problem, there's a lot of pain before there's any real progress. Just because you've always done something some way doesn't mean that that's the right way. Doesn't mean that that's modernized for who we are today. When I think about the outcomes that we're able to help young people achieve, it, it just amazes me and it makes me want to put in a lot more. My name is Tashna Gavinder. My name is Aaron Moat. My name is Akshay Saxena, and I believe in leveling the playing field for students in India. I use data to help first-generation university students in South Africa graduate and thrive. And I focus on technology, innovation, and in the classroom. We have an old system, and frankly, an old way of measuring whether or not children are succeeding. The changes we were going to build had to be disruptive in a way that shifted those paradigms. The unique challenges in South Africa is that only a third of students that are in the higher education sector make it to graduation. And so the foundation saw an opportunity for us to put in place a rather unique but rich wraparound support program. There's many axes to inequality in India. One of the most important is where you went to school. The way Avanti is trying to solve this problem is in two ways. The first is by innovating on classroom pedagogy and classroom technology. The other axis where we're really innovating is creating a new generation of teachers. Technology enables our students to access this learning opportunities that close the digital achievement gap, but also become advocates of their own learning. I think it's the faces behind the data that makes it all worthwhile. If you're new to philanthropy, my advice is that some of these issues are bigger than you are. Think about the disruption that is closest to you, that's closest to your heart. Picking problems where you feel you have special knowledge, special capability, and an ability to make a greater difference. Because that's the place you're going to have the biggest impact. All of these things, things coming together basically means that there are going to be a lot more smart, motivated, committed people applying the same innovation, the same dedication that was behind building successful commercial enterprises to this space. And hopefully we can change things in the next 20 or 30 years. So please welcome to the stage our conscious disruptors, Akshay Suxina, Aaron Moat, and Tashlin Govendor. What's up, guys? Hi. It's so exciting to have them here. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so first off, for each of you, what has been your personal journey into this work? So I'm an accidental educator. I'm someone who came to education after a career in international development. Wow. And uh, I was left the public sector. Mm -hmm. I was walking down the street one day with my husband, mm -hmm. uh, ready to go back uh, to the public sector after working in a lot of name brand technology companies that you all know. Mm -hmm. And I felt really disconnected mm -hmm. from the work. Mm -hmm. And so walking down the street with my now husband, he wasn't my husband then, that's another story, another day, uh -huh. uh, he, looked at me and he said, that doesn't really work for me. And he said, what's the most impactful thing that you've done mm -hmm. in the last couple months? And I looked at him and I remember connecting schools in Washington, D.C. and Anacostia, neighborhoods that were 15 miles from my home in Washington, D.C. And he looked at me and he said, well, we could start a school. Mm. And so we drew Brooklyn Lab on a napkin. I still have the napkin. And uh, now we serve 479 students, 40% of whom are complex learners, 20% of whom are homeless, in the heart of downtown Brooklyn, in the community where I live, wow. and where I'm raising my son with my now husband. Wow, <laughs> wow. amazing. Congratulations. Yeah, That's yeah. Great. 
So Ashley. Jason, I was, uh, <clears throat> so I was the first person in my family to actually go to university. And I studied as a public health specialist uh, because I wanted to actually help people uh, and improve on their health. Um, but after working several years in the public health system in South Africa, I felt that I wasn't actually making a dent. And uh, the foundation was opening up their offices in South Africa, and I joined the foundation about seven years ago to actually build the Dalian Leaders Program, which is a scholarship program that serves the most disadvantaged young South Africans to get to university and yeah. into the world of work. And we have 565 students that have been awarded the scholarship. Mm. Um, and it's a tremendous opportunity to be able to build and foster a new generation of leaders in the country. Sure. Wonderful. Akshay. So I fell in love with teaching. <laughs> Uh, and uh, you know the journey really started with you know with me being in the United States uh, and us doing Avanti's work sort of on the side as a way to give back. Sure. Uh, and then as we started to get you know deeper into this, you know, and we we started teaching children ourselves, you know, it's very hard not to fall in love with with educating young people. Yeah. Uh, and when you add to that the layer of you know of, of economic disparity, social disparity, and you realize that. You know, in your hands and in your actions, you have the power to really change this. It's a very hard problem to walk away from. Sure. <laughs> and Tashlin, let me ask you, we heard from Janet that the new philanthropists are anyone who works for positive change, close to home or on a global scale. Right. So in your opinion, what are the defining traits of conscious disruptors? So Jason, I think conscious disruptors are young, talented, resourceful young leaders mm. that are working towards um, improving communities and they're driving social impact. They subscribe to philanthropeneurship uh, and they're pretty pragmatic in their approach mm. uh, in the way they do their work. Uh, they're open to failure because they believe they, the more they fail, the more they'll be able to learn. And I think they're also very empathetic learners. So mm. they learn from the communities of the people that they're trying to serve. Beautiful. And Aaron, with that looking to the coming decade, you know, what type of collaboration do you think is needed to enhance the effectiveness of your social impact work? Well, I'm very hopeful, like Susan, about the future. I'm so optimistic because yeah. I'm surrounded by uh, young people every yeah. single day with this energy to change the world and change their own communities. Here's what I see coming. This principle of uncommon alliances. Yeah. So I told you I wasn't from education. I'm a technologist. Yeah. And so in a way, I formed my own uncommon alliance with sure. my community, yeah. bringing technology to work with students. But I see young people who uh, work with uh, NYU students to print a Batmobile mm -hmm. in hackerspace. It's mm -hmm. awesome with this 3D printer. And shout out to my 479 kids back in Brooklyn, do your homework, uh, who are watching right now. Uh, or an NYU professor who comes in and uh, works with our math teacher sure. to teach robotics every Wednesday so our students have a deeper understanding of conceptual math. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's a parent who for the first time is coming into a community school and is advocating for better meals mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for their young person. And so this concept of uncommon alliances mm -hmm. really bringing together different sectors mm -hmm. to make wide scale change mm -hmm. both in your community and globally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Akshay, how important is technological innovation to your social impact work? I think it's the core of it, mm. uh, but, it but often in a way that you won't think Right, which is kind of counterintuitive. When, when we started, you know, as people trained in technology, we thought you know, that our, our technology products were the answer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But as you start to dig deeper, you start to realize that you know, technology has to do, I think, two things. One is act as a scaffold around all the intense human work that you do mm -hmm. uh, in this field. And the second is, of course, provide the ramp with which to, with which to scale it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so our most important technology systems are the ERP systems that monitor the progress of all of our teachers and over mm. 6,000 kids, mm. right? Uh, our most important technology systems are things that allow us to measure the impact of what we are teaching and when we are teaching it. So in many ways, technology is often in the background, yeah. but incredibly important. Sure. Yeah, and just to pick up on something Akshay just said, you know, tech is never going to replace a great teacher. Right. You have to lead with people, not product. Yeah. And when we think about what data can do to serve and form and enhance teaching and learning, as that innovation picks up, imagine what we can unlock in young people yeah. and the next generation of Beautiful. conscious disruptors. Beautiful. I mean, I think we have a common saying amongst all of us in South Africa that technology is the enabler. Mm. Uh, it, it only solves half of the problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Now, I feel like I've been asking a lot of questions. <laughs> Susan, you probably have a question. 
Yeah, you know, so tell us about the single biggest challenge that you face day to day. Yeah, so I think for, for us, it's, it's attracting quality human capital to the space. Uh, and it's become easier. I think, you know, even this conversation makes it easier. Mm. Uh, because I think traditionally, especially in India, you know, this, this sector was seen as, was not really seen as a place you could have an enriching, you know, impactful career, mm -hmm. uh, both personally as well as on, on the world, right? I think on the world was more obvious, but personally, could you have an enriching career? Maybe, maybe not. And I think the more we talk about this and the more of this that happens, uh, people will start to realize that this is probably the most impactful and the most en enriching career they can have, and they can fulfill all of their personal needs, uh, but also change the world. Mm. To add to what Akshay said, I mean, I think it's you're working, in order to make um, large impact, you need to be able to work with government, and you need to be able to work with large institutions. You need to be able to take people along with you in your particular idea, and that can sometimes be difficult. Uh, so it's about having the patience and being persistent, um, knowing that there's a bigger goal that everybody's kind of working towards, mm. uh, and that sometimes can be pretty challenging. Yeah, I mean, double highlight strike throughs, however I can say yes, yes. Um, I think one of the things that's really important is how do you gain license to innovate? Uh -huh. How do you demonstrate measurable results so that you can do that next crazy thing? Um, and I think that is what has allowed me to make a huge impact in education mm -hmm. is that our students are doing well. Mm -hmm. Our families are doing well. Mm -hmm. um, our community believes in me, yeah. believes in us. Yeah. And so that has given me this amazing license to innovate. Mm -hmm. And, and, and when you think about the next, you know, five or ten years, all the changes that are going on in the world, mm -hmm. what do you think are the traits that are going to define success for, you know, folks like yourselves, other, you know, foundations that are out there, individuals that are trying to make a difference in the world? Would love to hear your perspective. So I think you have to be humble, because and have a spirit of radical candor. Mm -hmm. You have to be humble because, listen, I fail a million times a day. I make a thousand mistakes. I have made lots of mistakes in my life. And that persistence, that grit, that ability to be humble, to say, hmm, let me pause, step back, and reflect, and be radically candid with myself and others, mm -hmm. I think those are two of the traits, not all, mm -hmm. that are going to make young people continue to be able to have this exponential rate of change. Mm. And I would hope philanthropy would adopt some of those things as well. I also think that I, uh, no man is an island. And I mm. think the more you speak about your ideas or what you're trying to solve for, the more you'll be able to rally people around you that will be like-minded and that will be equally as driven and passionate about a particular cause. And so being able to collaborate and to be able to network and share uh, some of those innovations is something that I think a lot of young social entrepreneurs that are working within this particular um, you know, issues will be able to kind of do. Yeah. And so, so I think agility is really important. Mm -hmm. uh, picking up from what Aaron said, I think you, you know, it's, it's very common to get um, and very, very, very natural to get rooted to your idea to solve the problem. And I think, you know, as, as we've discussed before, you know, we fail a lot. And, and it's very likely that, that, the, that the first, the second, the third try, stab at pro, you know, solving the problem is probably not the right approach. So I think both from, from, from the funding side, from the support network, from the entrepreneurs, being able to burn things to the ground and start again uh, with what you've learned is incredibly important. Mm. So disruptors, you know, our conversation today is brimming with optimism, which I, I love. And I want to know what gives you hope, but I also want to know what keeps you up at night. I think the one thing that gives me hope is the, the darling leaders that we have in South Africa. I mean, we have 150 graduates, and to know that each of them are now working and being able to provide for their families, but then also to go back to the communities and have some sort of meaningful impact is, is huge. I mean, I think um, there's no amount of value that you can place on that. Mm -hmm. But I do know that there's you know, the youth unemployment rate of South Africa is 50%, and 50% of youth have no opportunities. And so we need to be able to work faster. We need to be able to scale the impact of, of the work that we've done on the Dalian Leaders Program um, in order to be able to reach as many more young people out there. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that keeps me up at night mm -hmm. uh, in order to be able to come up with some solutions that we can actually scale. 
Yeah, I, I think for me, uh, and we've seen this in our work, the fact that children from massive disadvantage can actually outperform, let's say, my children, yeah. uh, is incredibly you know, exhilarating and gives me a lot of hope because I think year after year, I think we've been able to prove with our work that kids with, you know, kids, irrespective of what has happened to them before they come to us, if they get the right sort of environment, they can do wonders. And that's, that, that's incredibly you know, exhilarating for me. Yeah. Uh, I think what, what does keep me up at night, I think, is, is I think a, uh, the reali realization that the number of people who are willing to demonstrate the, the things we talked about, you know, the agility, the, the, the grit, the ability to persist, is still very small. It's still a small community. Yeah. Uh, and, and it needs to grow exponentially, and it needs to get really, really big. Yeah. I think conversations like this give me hope. Um, you know, one of the things I think that it can be lonely to be a social entrepreneur. It can be lonely to be an innovator. Um, and I have been blessed uh, to have not only a community that supports me, but wonderful partners, including the foundation, who frankly took a risk on me and believed in what we were doing for our community. And I think much like my fellow panelists, you know, this idea that uh, sometimes it feels like it's a pebble in the pond. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just uh, held our lottery for Brooklyn Lab. And we only have 200 seats next year that are available mm -hmm. in our community. And we had over 1,600 applications. Wow. So I let my staff do all the like, congratulations. And I have to call the families and I call everyone that don't get it, mm -hmm. that don't get that seat. Mm -hmm. And to hear those tears and to hear those voices, it keeps me up at night because I want every student right. to have the opportunity that I know my son will have, that I know the other 200 students will have. Wow. <sighs> wow. So, Tashlin, uh, what key piece of advice would you give to somebody who wants to get involved and have a positive impact on the world but doesn't know where to begin? Right. So I think um, you know, any so social entrepreneur that wants to get involved in the work should basically roll up their sleeves and get started. I think there's many civic organizations or many schools that would require someone who is passionate about a particular cause that would want to kind of give back. It's a great way for you to be able to use your skill to help a particular organization and for you to be able to build the ability to, to you know, learn things about yourself. So for example, how do you work with ambiguity? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, most social entrepreneurs mm -hmm. will tell you that uh, you never have the answer. You might have all of the data to suggest which path you should take, but it isn't necessarily the solution to the problem. Mm -hmm. And so working with organizations and, and volunteering is one way of doing it. Uh, and then I think the second is, um, you know, a lot of people underestimate time, uh, you know, time that you put into a particular issue um, and, and being able to kind of rally people around you in mm -hmm. order to be able to be that force for a particular cause or, or being the voice for the voiceless mm -hmm. is something that is, is super impactful. And I think uh, social entrepreneurs can definitely get involved in those ways. Wonderful. So uh, Aaron, Akshay, Tashlin, will you each share a final thought or a piece of advice with our audience? Right, I can go first. I think um, uh, for me, the, the advice I give many people, I think, who, who want to come to the space is I think one is you've got to dream really big. Mm. Yeah. Um, I, and I think the second is you've always got to have hope. Mm. Right? We work in settings where, you know, it's, and often in our day to day conversations, we're discussing the problem so much uh, that it starts to eat away at, at this kernel of hope that you have in yeah. you. So, so I think as long as we continue to dream big, we're agile and we have tons of hope. Uh, we'll get there. Mm. I think the one thing is to be patient. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, some of these issues that you're working uh, are bigger than you. And it's, uh, it's things that you can't touch and feel. You know, I wish I could have a conversation with poverty. Uh, yeah. Because when I look at the lives of children that are suffering every day, it, it just seems so unfair. Um, so I think being persistent and being patient, uh, knowing that eventually if you work hard at it, uh, you're bound to make some sort of an impact. Beautiful. Yeah, I mean, I've been lucky enough to find that place where passion meets profession. Uh -huh. And if you can do that, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah. But if you can't do that, if you uh, can't get there, you can do something really simple. You can just turn to your neighbor and say, what can I do to help you today? Yeah. Beautiful. 
Well, guys, this, what a wonderful group of disruptors. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, you know, it's been so enlightening to hear from all of you today, and we appreciate each and every one of you for sharing your thoughts with us. And we are so grateful for the incredible example that you're showing to so many of us uh, with your hard work and your determination to make a huge difference, a real difference in your communities and in the world. And you know, I'm certain that everyone who's watching today is extremely inspired by not only your hard work, but your stories and everything that we've learned from you. So thank you so much. And I just have to add that, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, what keeps you up late at night, you know, I'm, I'm with you. I mean, what keeps me up late at night is the fact that, you know, we're one foundation and you're doing everything that you can. But what I love about a forum like this, and mm. thank you, Jason, for, for doing this today, is that hopefully we're, we're letting people understand that anybody who cares about others can be a philanthropist. Mm -hmm. And it's going to take all of us, everyone in the world, to actually have a conversation with poverty and do whatever it is that they can, whether it's giving their time or their energy or their talent or their skill or their resources, whatever that may be, to try to help those who actually really do need our help because uh, it can't be done by just a small group. So thank you for everything that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. I mean, your, your examples are, are very inspiring and it's you know, wonderful to see the, the, the passion each of you have for what you're doing. You know, uh, I think uh, yeah. we need more folks like you in the world. Absolutely. Uh, and and, and it's, it's, it's great to see. I mean, as, as I think about this, Jason, and yeah. sort of what we've been discussing today, um, you know, there, there are a lot of really big challenges out there in, in, in the world. And um, you know, it's kind of easy to focus on those, but uh, the, you know, uh, I like to think about it in terms of how do we find big opportunities, mm -hmm. right? That each of us in our own way can go figure out how to address, uh, you know, and step by step uh, with determination and grit, as you said, uh, you can make a big change in the world. And, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's what we're all working towards. Just keep, keep on keeping at it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> wow. Well, right. disruptors, thank you guys so much. Thank and you. Michael and Susan, what, a, what an honor. What an amazing thing. And I, I personally challenge myself mm -hmm. and all of you guys out there to live as conscious disruptors. Start by tapping into your passion and pushing those boundaries. And be sure to visit impact.msdf.org for the full list of the Dell Social Impact Principles to download the philanthropy guide to the future and to join the conscious disruptor community if you're curious and you can relate to the conversation today again impact.msdf.org it's a great place to start thank you all for tuning in today thank you guys for being here thank you to everybody and I'll leave you with some words now some words of wisdom from the amazing team at the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation let's roll the video when we're talking about solving big problems Sometimes it's about taking big risks. Really what the key is, is finding where you are uniquely positioned to make a difference that other partners in the space can't make. You have to be committed to a vision. You have to put in the time to see these projects through. When I started in my dorm room, there was no playbook. We created our own path. We saw opportunities, experimented, took risks, made mistakes, and improved all along the way. And Susan and I have applied the same thinking to our foundation. The journey is one where you take two steps forward and then three steps back. If you give up, you're never going to achieve the goals you want. If these problems were easy, they would have been solved centuries ago. We have built our foundation to become a major contributor in the world. There's truly not a, a project or grant that we do that I'm not proud of and passionate of. If we don't have that passion, then we shouldn't do it. We want to figure out how to do it better, how to do it smarter, uh, how to do it more quickly. Because I think we do all have that feeling of a sense of urgency in all of the areas in which we work. There is no lack of problems needing creative solutions. But it's so inspiring to see how many people in this generation are willing to take on those challenges and to find new ways of solving them. I'm a first generation college student myself, so there's nothing more rewarding than knowing that what we're doing here is really you know, having a direct impact. And we're also very lucky that we're in this position to do that. And the exciting news is we're just getting started.